Birds and chickens are a wonderful way to bring life to the garden. Not only are they fun to watch, but they bring some hidden benefits as well. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Join me next. One of the most enjoyable aspects of having a garden is being able to include some pets. I love dogs and cats. They're great as pets. But if you really want to push the envelope, try some chickens, like this little bantam rooster. Now, bantams are the pint-sized members of the poultry family. This one is a barred Plymouth Rock, and his name is Elroy. He does a lot in my garden to help take care of pests and produces some pretty powerful fertilizer. Nadine, his female counterpart here, well, she produces eggs for the kitchen. Today we're going to travel to a regional poultry show where you'll meet people that consider raising chickens a great stress reliever and a rewarding hobby. We'll also see if little Elroy here can hold his own with the competition and the judges. And Elroy isn't the only bird hanging around my garden. If you're like me and enjoy all different kinds of birds visiting your garden, I have a special cake recipe that's definitely for the birds. Now if you're into exotic beauty, have I got the place for you? We'll visit the Orchid Zone, where you'll have your choice of some of the most beautiful orchids in the country. We'll look at the characteristics of these colorful beauties, and I'll share some tips on how to get rewarding results while growing them. And if that's not enough for you, I'll share with you one of my favorite plants for the garden. It's the ivy geranium. These are outstanding performers and can add so much charm to a window box or container. But first things first, Elroy is getting a little anxious about the competition. Now I'll meet you at the poultry show next when we come back, so don't go away. Well, we've made it. Elroy and the Pullets and I are here at the Arkansas Oklahoma Poultry Show. And as you can hear and see, there are a lot of contestants. In fact, there are over 1,100 entries in this show. The judges have already started over in the other barn, so it's time for me to get Elroy in his designated place here among the entries. But before I do that, I'm going to kind of dress up his comb just a little bit. It's a little wind chap. So I'm just going to take a cloth with a vegetable oil base on it and just rub it across his comb like this to really bring the color to life. I think he's loving this. I'm gonna put some oil on his legs. This really brings out the yellow coloration, which is, by the way, a characteristic of this breed, the Plymouth Rock. They're all different colors of Plymouth Rocks. They're white Plymouth Rocks, Partridge Plymouth Rocks, Colombian Plymouth Rocks, and of course, Barred Plymouth Rocks. This all indicates the plumage color pattern. Okay, now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little shine on the feather. And hold him just like this. I use some of this finish sheen. Shut your eyes, Elroy. This bird has to be perfectly quaffed. This will knock any dust off. Look at that. A first prize winner. You know, there are a lot of different reasons why people show poultry. Let's just take a look at a few. When I go out at the end of the day and take care of my chickens or at the beginning, I just, it just relaxes me and I enjoy, I let them out on my yard and I, I like to watch them. It's just, some people get fish aquariums for much the same reason that some people get chickens. It just, it's a stress relief and the competition is fun. It's just enjoyment of being competitive with, with your friends and neighbors. It's really a good hobby. And uh, my husband has had some health problems, and I think this is very good for him because it keeps him active. It's just a lot of fun. You know, many parents have discovered that giving a child something living to care for and to raise is a wonderful way to teach them responsibility and stewardship. Here's a family who's done just that. This is Richard and Susan Wright, okay. and their son Sawyer. And the guy going into the cage is Ernest. So what brought this family into the world of poultry? 
Well, it started as Easter chicks. We had two, and they were small enough for our son, who's three, to be a part of watching them and feeding them. And it just kind of evolved from that to Ernest growing up so big. So the little chicks grew up. Grew up, and they had children. <laughs> Those children are having children, and so it's, it's really a unique, wonderful experience uh, for children to have hands-on. We live in the city. We have uh, less than an acre. We live on a corner lot, so there's hardly any space at all required for the chickens. We started showing him at the county fair. We thought we'd just give it a try. How'd we wanted. He did really well. In fact, he won best of show at wow. the county fair. First time out, so we were real happy about him. It was a great learning experience in the sense that we were exposed to lots of other breeds. We were we were shocked that Ernest grew up to be this huge rooster. You know, we're already planning and, you know, from what we've learned um, this year, you know, adding to it and, and developing um, or trying to, to, to raise a, even a better, you know, rooster or, or a hen. And, you know, entering next year. So, so you'll be back. We'll be back. You know, you don't have to have a garden to grow flowers. These orchids are a great way to brighten up the inside of your home. We'll take a look at some outstanding examples that are sure to inspire you coming up next. Orchids, without question, are some of the most fantastic of all flowers. I can't help but marvel at their beauty and design. There are over 35,000 species of orchids across the world, making them a huge family of plants. As you might expect, in a world where our natural environment is becoming all too fast replaced with paving and parking decks, many of these orchids have become endangered. Terry Root at the Orchid Zone takes conservation of orchids seriously. He maintains thousands of varieties, of which several dozen are in danger. While growing orchids is his business and his love, he is also committed to protecting them. The greatest uh, threat to orchids is habitat destruction. Uh, and we grow some here that we believe to be uh, totally extinct in nature, and if it weren't for operations like this, they'd no longer exist at all. No telling how many haven't been discovered yet. This is one right here that was discovered in 1984, and prior to that time it wasn't known in cultivation at all. And we've been mass producing this one for the last uh, number of years, and produce these by the thousands, so it's no longer a rare item. We perpetuate the orchids by making a selection of the traits we want to uh, perpetuate. We make the pollination, and that uh, seed develops on the plant over a period of a year. Then we take it to the laboratory and put it in a sterile bottle of agar. After a few months and it germinates, we transfer it to another flask where it has more space to develop and after about a year in there, it comes out and it's a greenhouse plant. Such delicate beauty that we can enjoy in our homes during the winter. It's all thanks to breeders like Terry. Without them, they wouldn't be available to us. With such a large family, it's probably no surprise that some orchids are easier to grow than others, like the Thalanopsis or the Lady Slipper Orchid. Both of these are ideal for growing in the home environment, whereas the Cattleya orchid is a little fussier. It prefers a greenhouse environment. The reason Phalaenopsis and lady slippers are favorite house plants is they'll take low light conditions. And when it comes to temperature, if you're comfortable, they are too. A bloom that'll last up to three months, now that's hard to beat in a house plant. It's always interested me how certain plants gain certain reputations. Take the orchid, for instance. Many people consider it difficult to grow, but it's actually not fussy at all, particularly these Phalaenopsis. And this time of year, there's nothing like a beautiful flowering orchid in your home to give it a little life. And in the midwinter, often garden centers and nurseries have the best selection. These plants can often be so covered in bloom, they need to be staked. But when it comes to staking and preparing orchids for my home, I like to take the approach that simpler is better, and I always like to use natural materials. For instance, in staking, I like to use these lichen-covered twigs. Any type of twig will do. You just want to make sure it has a nice, gentle arc, 
and you can remove any side stems. And then just stick it into the container and it will serve as a stake. Next, gently tie the stem of the orchid to the stake with some raffia. And then at the base of the plant, use some sheet moss, which you can pick up at a local florist. This approach to styling orchids will work whether your home is casual or more formal. Coming up, we'll take a look at some beautiful ivy geraniums. These gals can sure charm a garden. We'll get a closer look when we come back, so don't go away. Welcome back. I'm Alan Smith. Wow, we've been all over the map today. We've taken a look at vibrant orchids in California and colorful chickens in the Ozark Mountains. You know, I can't imagine my garden without the fanciful fun chickens can bring. They just add a certain sense of humor. They liven things up. Now, another way to liven things up in the garden is with bold color. One of the best plants for this is the ivy geranium. I've long admired this annual for its ability to brighten up an area with lots of color, but I became really impressed with them after a visit to Europe where I saw ivy or trailing geraniums cascading out of window boxes at every turn. These are characterized by long trailing stems and glossy green succulent leaves. These plants bloom continuously from late spring to the first frost in the fall. Like most geraniums, wait until the danger of frost has passed before setting the plants out in the garden, since they're frost tender. In fact, geraniums grow best in daytime temperatures between 70 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit and nighttime temperatures of 55 to 65. Geraniums need to be fertilized frequently during the active growing season, so that's why I feed my plants with a complete, well-balanced liquid fertilizer, such as 10-20-10. You see, this 10-20-10 ratio is where a lot of people get confused by fertilizers, but it's really not as complicated as you might think. You should just keep in mind that there are three basic elements in fertilizer that are important for all of our garden plants to stay happy and healthy. Now, I don't want to oversimplify this, the amount of food you give a plant depends on its age and the type of soil you have and other things. But basically, plants need large quantities of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are the three elements we see on bags of fertilizer. The first of the three numbers represents nitrogen. Now this element is important because it helps with vigorous growth and produces lots of leafy foliage. It's the sort of thing as you might expect which would be ideal for lawns because you're producing blades of grass, but not the sort of thing you would want to put on tomatoes because you would produce lots of leaves and not much fruit. Let me show you what I mean. This bag of lawn food is loaded with nitrogen. If you look at the ratio, you see it's 28, 4, 4. That means in 100 pounds of this fertilizer, there'd be 28 pounds of nitrogen, 4 pounds of phosphorus, and 4 pounds of potassium. That middle number is phosphorus, and it's important for the production of blooms and fruit. So I use it on my perennials and in my vegetable garden. The last number is potassium, and this is good for the production of strong roots and stems. Now, there are other trace elements that are important for plants as well, but it's a well-balanced diet that makes them the happiest. And we all know that happy plants certainly make us gardeners happy. You know, I can't wait to add some of those geraniums to my garden this summer both in window boxes and containers. And this winter, I'll be adding some birds. I want to share with you a tasty recipe that'll have the birds calling your garden home. That's coming up next, so don't go away. When it comes to nature's many pleasures, one of my favorites is having colorful birds visit my garden. So let's go shopping and see how we can attract some of our favorite feathered friends. With the increased popularity for feeding the birds, specialty shops have popped up to meet the demand. They're basically delicatessens for birds. You can't imagine all of the different foods. For instance, this one is called birdola. It's like a bird granola. And all of these are different types of suet cakes basically a bird food made from beef fat and other things. For instance, this one is made with almonds, and here's one that's actually packed with insects. And this one called fruit cakes is made with papaya and orange. Now the reason for all the variety is that each one of these attracts different kinds of birds. 
but I have a general recipe that you can make at home and it starts with a trip to the grocery store. The key ingredient or the glue that binds these suet cakes together is the fat trimmed and discarded by the butcher. Most butchers will be happy to give this to you and some will even grind it up which will make it easier to use. Other ingredients you'll need, cornmeal, oats, and some peanut butter. I always go for the extra crunchy. And you'll also need bird seed of your choice. To prepare this recipe, cook one pound of beef fat down until it's in liquid form. Then add one cup of peanut butter, one cup of rolled oats, and one cup of cornmeal, and a cup of your favorite bird seed. Then pour the mixture into a form, any disposable container will do, and let it cool and solidify. Hanging it in a wire cage like this will keep other garden visitors from taking this homemade treat from the birds. Speaking of birds, let's see how Elroy fared at the poultry show. Well, here we are where my barred rocks are well, placed. I want to see what you think. All right, let's take a look at it. He's a little bit wild, sort of hard to get out. Is yeah. it, haven't you been taking good care of it? Well, I've been trying to. Okay. <laughs> what do you think, this, Gene? Well, a barred rock bantam. Hi, guys, she's got a nice little head. He's about the right color. And one thing I love about him is he looks the same color everywhere. You follow what I'm same saying? Tonal, same uh, tonal color. Same tonal color. Whether right. you look here, here, or here. Now, the, the bars are black and white. I have to criticize this bird a little bit because Go ahead. he's not perfectly straight, these bars. I you see, see a little white There's and a black right, sure. going into each other? Yeah. It's a very good wing. A wing's hard to get. You know something? Your cocker won second pipe. Did it really? Yeah. My goodness, yeah. second. I never would have thought. There's only one uh, one other one that beat, beat you, and he is just a little bit shorter barred, but he's about the, <laughs> well, I'll uh, be. better than color. How Good about job, that? old boy. Yeah. This is Elroy. Elroy. Yeah. <laughs> This garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile oh, No, I can't help but smile. 